Good afternoon. Hello, DJ. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining for this uh, Friday press briefing on COVID-19. Uh, welcome to all people watching us on uh, WHO Twitter account, uh, journalists uh, who are dialing in uh, through mobile phones. Uh, you will need, as any other day, to press uh, star nine to ask questions, and those who are watching us through Zoom online to click raise and uh, today uh, we have, as most of the days, Dr. Tedros, Dr. Maria Van Kierkov, and Dr. Mike Ryan. We also have a couple of colleagues uh, sitting in the back, uh, Dr. Adriana Velasquez, Dr. Maria Angela Simao, Dr. Ana Maria Henao, Dr. Marie Pierre Preciosi, and Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, who may also be asked to answer some of the questions. Uh, as always, we will have an audio file and transcript from this press conference. And I will just really remind everyone, if it's possible, to ask one question, please. So we let all uh, colleagues to ask their questions. So please, let's try to respect that. Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And good afternoon, and thank you once again for joining us in person and online. And I would like to start by acknowledging International Women's Day this Sunday. This is a moment to remember that around the world, many women cannot access essential health services and continue to suffer disproportionately from preventable and treatable diseases. But International Women's Day is an opportunity not only to promote and protect the health of women, but to highlight the vital role they play in promoting and protecting the health of all people. Globally, women make up 70% of the global health workforce, but hold only 25% of senior roles. WHO is committed to promoting gender equality everywhere, and especially in the health workforce. We're proud that we have achieved gender equality in our senior leadership team at WHO headquarters, although we know we still have to work to do in other parts of the organization. Women are also playing a vital role in the, in the resp response to COVID-19. And we're proud to have many amazing women leading our response in WHO, including Maria, Silvi, Somia, Anna Maria, Maria Angela, Mary Pierre, Adriana, Gabi, Nika, and many others. In the past 24 hours, 2,736 cases of COVID. 19 were reported from 47 countries and territories. There is now a total of 98,023 reported cases of COVID-19 globally and 3,380 deaths. We are now on the verge of reaching 100,000 confirmed cases. As cases increase, we are continuing to recommend that all countries make containment their highest priority. We continue to call on countries to find, test, isolate, and care for every case and to trace every contact. Slowing down the epidemic saves lives and buys time for preparedness and for research and development. Every day we can slow the epidemic is the epidemic is another day hospitals can prepare themselves for cases. Every day we slow down the epidemic is another day governments can prepare their health workers to detect, test, treat, and care for patients. Every day we slow down the epidemic is another day closer 
to having vaccines and therapeutics which can in turn prevent infections and save lives. As you know, last month WHO convened a meeting of more than 400 scientists to identify research priorities. Hundreds of ideas were discussed and debated. And today, we're publishing an R&D roadmap which distills those ideas into a core group of priorities in nine key areas. These include the natural history of the virus, epidemiology, vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, clinical management, ethical considerations, social sciences, and more. The R&D roadmap focuses on research that can save lives now, as well as longer-term research priorities for vaccines and therapeutics. It's vital to coordinate research so that different groups around the world complement each other, so WHO can give better advice and con countries can take evidence-based decisions that save lives. That's why WHO has developed a set of core protocols that outline standards of how studies should be done and to collect critical data so we can compare apples with apples and pull data from multiple studies. France and South Africa have already indicated they will use these protocols for clinical trials, and we encourage other countries to do the same. We are also developing research protocols to assess interventions for disenfranchised communities, such as refugees and internally displaced persons. We are very encouraged by the level of interest around the world in accelerating research as part of the response. So far, WHO has received applications for review and approval of 40 diagnostic tests, 20 vaccines are in development, and many clinical tri trials of therapeutics are underway. Even as we test therapeutics, we need to ensure that supplies of those medicines are available should they prove effective. WHO has been monitoring the potential risk of a disruption to medicine supplies as a result of the COVID-19 epidemic. China, as you know, is a major producer of active pharmaceutical ingredients and the intermediate products that are used to produce medicines in other countries. WHO has focused on the most essential medicines that are critical for primary health care and emergencies, including antibiotics, painkillers, and treatments for diabetes, hypertension, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. WHO is working closely with industry associations, regulators, and other partners to monitor this risk. And so far, we have not identified any imminent specific shortages. Many ma manufacturers either have alternative sources of ingredients or had stocks to draw on. Manufacturing has now resumed in most places in China, although some challenges remain. Separately, WHO has developed a list of more than 20 essential medical devices that countries need to manage patients, including ventilators and oxygen supply systems. Access to medical oxygen could be the difference between life and death for some patients, but there is already a shortage in many countries which could be exa exacerbated by this epidemic. WHO has an existing working group with the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and PATH. And we're building on that partnership to increase access to oxygen. We encourage every country to review WHO's disease commodity package for COVID-19 to ensure it has the supplies it needs, including protective equipment and medical devices. 
All of this requires the involvement of the private sector to ensure countries can access life-saving products. You have heard me talk about the market failure for personal protective equipment. You heard me talk about the need for a whole of government approach. And you have heard me talk about what individuals can do to protect themselves and others. We look forward to businesses to step up and play their part. We need you. WHO is working with the World Economic Forum to engage companies around the world. And earlier this week, I spoke to more than 200 CEOs about how they can protect their staff and customers, ensure business continuity, and contribute to the response. As I keep saying, we are all in this together. And we, will, we all have a role to play. Facts, not fear. Reasons, not rumors. Solidarity, not stigma. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for these opening remarks. We will start uh, with the questions here from the room. Uh, we'll have to start with the Chen, then Badia, and then we'll have a question here. Uh, yes, we don't use the microphone. If you can just switch it off and talk a little bit louder. <laughs> so, uh, Chen from uh, Xinhua News Agency. Uh, the uh, epicenter of the epidemic uh, is in China. Of course, recently, uh, Fox News host demanded a formal apology from Chinese for the outbreak of coronavirus. Uh, so, um, what's the comment from WHO towards the uh, remark? Thank you. Um, I'm not aware of the comment. But uh, I think we've said uh, numerous times in previous con uh, conferences that uh, diseases can emerge anywhere on the planet and have proven to do so. Uh, Ebola emerges very often in Africa. The last pandemic emerged in North America uh, of H1N1. And coronavirus has, in this case, emerged in China. So um, I think uh, the, the issue now is, uh, as the DG has just said, uh, can we avoid blame culture and can we move on to do the things we need to do to save lives? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Maria, please, and then we'll go to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Official reports in Iran shows a huge spike in identified cases of COVID-19. The spokesperson of Health Ministry today said that you know, they identified more than 1,200 for past 12, uh, 24 hours. How do you actually categorize or assess the way the outbreak is managed in Iran, especially when we have a mission in um, It's very important in epidemic response to understand your problem, because without understanding your problem, it's very difficult to fix it. So uh, we've seen this. China's numbers went up uh, very, very quickly because they started to look for cases. The same happened in Korea, when Korea started to do active surveillance. And then you can turn a corner. So I think uh, we need to look at these data uh, in terms of, yes, natural epidemiology, but also I think because uh, the Iranian system is switching on. We're seeing a much more uh, all-of-government approach, as the DG called for yesterday. There's a national action plan now. There's 100,000 workers committed to this plan. Uh, and uh, we are going to see uh, any country in the face of an epidemic when it looks for cases, we'll find them. Um, uh, and if we call that a bad thing, it is. It's, it's a sad thing for the people who have the disease. But it's much better that we understand the extent of the problem. So we commend a move towards uh, more aggressive, targeted surveillance. Uh, and we hope that that will lead to the kind of control measures that can help push this virus back. Thank you very much. One question here, then we will move online. Uh, one question, please. Uh, um, hi, my name is Ken. I'm from the Japanese newspaper Yomiuri. Um, I'd like to ask about um, Japan and Korea, it's uh, travel restrictions. And um, so both nations have been um, implementing travel uh, policies against each other. And um, in Japan, part of the Korean measures are taken to be retaliatory. And so can you uh, tell us uh, about um, to what, what extent these uh, travel restrictions are meaningful? And do you have any concerns if um, uh, 
any concerns on countries um, countering and escalating against each other. The, um, I think we've been pretty clear on the issue of travel restrictions for a very long time. Uh, they should be very carefully considered. They should be public health evidence driven. They should be of short duration and they should never be carried out in the absence of a comprehensive set of measures to contain or control the disease. Um, there is a long history, unfortunately, of countries sometimes uh, with tit-for-tat travel restrictions, and that has happened in the past. Since the advent of the IHR, in fact, we've seen a huge improvement in that and in transparency between countries because we challenge countries who put in place travel restrictions and we challenge them to provide the public health uh, evidence. Um, I think, again, I think Japan and Korea are both doing a fine job in the face of this epidemic. They've both scaled up their public health operations. They're saving lives, and I think we should focus on that uh, and not necessarily on uh, political spats over travel restrictions. It's very, very important that people understand that these types of restrictions are not helping. Uh, and in that sense, uh, to overemphasize them is to hurt the, the response. But we do commend both governments for making significant progress in fighting this disease. If I could just say something on, uh, to, the, to the contrary to that, in the sense that what we are seeing and what the stories need to be focusing in is how countries are helping each other. And we see a lot of examples of this. You know, uh, the DG mentioned this research meeting that took place on the 11th and 12th. We've been talking since the beginning of scientists communicating with each other, clinicians talking to each other on the phone, sharing experiences. When the world didn't have experience with COVID-19, we had MERS scientists teaching each other about what they did to help patients with MERS, patients with SARS. And I think there's a lot of very positive stories here where countries are helping each other. We have a Chinese delegation in Iran right now. Um, we have um, people participating and sharing. And I think, I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned in that. This is not the first outbreak where this has happened before. Um, WHO brings together um, scientists all over the world, public health professionals, women on the front lines. Um, and I think, I think those are stories that also need to make the headlines as well. Um, I would like to add to that. Um, in a globalized world, the only option is to stand together. And, you know, all countries should really uh, make sure that we stand together. And in addition to that, as you know, COVID-19 is a common enemy. And the only way we can beat this virus is when we stand together. And that's, that has been the message from WHO all along. And it is, and it will be. So we call on all countries to stand in, 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 in unison because it's the united force that can help us to beat this virus as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to uh, some of the journalists who are online. Uh, and I'll remind everyone, it's a star nine if you are dialing in and clicking raise hand if you are uh, on, uh, on Zoom. We will start with the Romania. We have Adrian. Adrian, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah, hello. I'm from uh, ProTV Romania. So speaking about Europe, uh, from your estimation, do you think that during the summer, the spread of COVID-19 will decrease? And another thing I want to know if uh, World Health Organization experts send uh, to all the countries some a person because we have some problems here in Romania and what are the criteria you set when you consider a person suspected of being infected with coronavirus? Are these standard procedures? Uh, Adrian, we, we, we lost you in the middle. Can you please repeat the question? Sorry for that. Speaking about Europe, from your estimation, do you think that during the summer the spread of COVID-19 will decrease? And another thing I want to know if uh, World Health Organization experts send to all the countries some procedures how to test a person and what are the criteria you set when you consider a person suspected of being infected with coronavirus? Thank you. Um, 
I think uh, Maria can take the, the, the question on, on, on seasonality. I think our regional director, to, we've had multiple, multiple meetings with the uh, European countries across our whole region, plus at the European Union level with the European Centre for Disease Control. Our regional director has been again in meetings today with European health ministers, coordinating actions between countries. Um, and uh, uh, we do not know yet uh, what the activity or the behaviour of this virus will be in different climatic conditions. Uh, we have to assume that the virus will uh, continue to have the capacity to spread. And it's a false hope to say, yes, it will just disappear in the summertime like influenza virus. We hope it does. I would, that would be a, a godsend. But uh, we can't make that assumption. And there is no evidence right now to suggest that that will happen. So we need to fight the virus now, not live in hope that the virus may disappear on its own. Uh, uh, and uh, on, on the issue of... Uh, uh, definitions. There are very specific case definitions that have been released and updated on a regular <coughs> basis by WHO. Maria may want to go into the detail on the criteria. So we, we do publish um, surveillance guidance on our website, as we do with all of our technical guidance, and we are constantly looking at the evolving situation um, to update those. Um, our case definitions um, are focusing on people of interest, um, who, who should be tested. And it's a combination, of, a combination of factors. It has to do with where a person is, where they are living, where they have traveled. It has to do with if they have symptoms or not, <coughs> and what level of symptoms that they have. So our latest guidance is on the WHO website. Um, um, and there's a very detailed description of who should be tested. And, I, and again, to be clear, when there is a high index of suspicion from a clinician, that the clinical syndrome is consistent, the clinician is in a position to, 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 to request a test. Uh, the, the test is not restrictive. The criteria are not restrictive. <clears throat> what we, we have to be careful with is that if every single person with a sniffle is to be tested, then we will run out of the capacity to test. So there are major criteria, but that final decision is very much left in the hand of the attending physician based on their uh, instinctive or clinical judgment. And if there are symptoms highly consistent with the COVID infection, mm -hmm. that physician may may request that test, or that is at least WHO's advice. Yes, and contacts. So that's the other one is not just in that, that index of suspicion, but also if you have a confirmed case and you're looking at the contacts of those cases, they need to be tested as well. Thank you very much. Uh, next question uh, came uh, through, uh, through message because there was Steve from Uganda, from MBS TV in Uganda. Uh, is asking what measures have been put in place to contain the virus in Uganda. He says Uganda being a poor country. I think um, uh, Uganda <clears throat> has proven its capacities over the last year and a half. Uh, Uganda has invested heavily in its preparedness for Ebola and uh, imported, unfortunately, Ebola twice from uh, Congo and uh, contain that disease without any further cases. Uh, Uganda has a lot of capacity and history in dealing with uh, severe emerging disease that spread from person to person and require the isolation of cases and the follow-up of contacts. And as the Director General has been saying for years now, this is about preparedness. You prepare for one disease, you prepare for all diseases. Preparing for Ebola gives you capacities against COVID. Preparing for flu gives you capacities against other diseases. And what we hope is that these investments that are being made by countries like Uganda uh, and that we want to make under, uh, under the uh, new emergency preparedness division here at WHO, uh, it's really important that we focus on that. Uh, other countries, uh, Uganda has a strong system, but we are concerned that there are countries who have much weaker surveillance, much weaker health systems, uh, and we need to continue to support all countries in getting ready. The DG may have a comment on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this was an uh, answer to question from Steve uh, from Uganda, NBS TV. Uh, if uh, Chris is fine, we can go to uh, one more question, or two more questions from online. Elaine Fletcher from Health Policy Watch. Banjo Kaur from Down to Earth, India. Banjo, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Please go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Maria. 
uh, Maria, we had uh, only five cases till three days ago, but now we are, you know, up to 30, 31 cases. But the testing criteria in our country is limited to sus suspected cases or to the ones who have been in contact with the confirmed cases. Do you recommend that, as Dr. Mike was saying, that we should now expand our criteria and a clinician, if he finds that it is necessary, be allowed to recommend a test, an investigation test? Thank you for the question. Um, so we, we put out recommendations of, of what we feel is, is most appropriate for testing. Um, and it is important that, that um, countries look at these and they make an assessment of what is best for their country. Our guidance is out there to be aggressive at finding all cases um, among people of suspicion and ensuring that the contacts of those cases are also tested so that we could prevent onward transmission. Um, decisions need to be made based on capacity, based on, on, on many different factors, but it really is important, especially early on, as you said, you have some cases in, in, in your country, it's very important that there's an aggressive approach in the beginning that you look for all of those cases um, because as case numbers increase systems become overwhelmed um, and so as much as can be done in the early stages of this the better chance you have to delay and to reduce and suppress transmission thank you very much we will now go to uh, elaine fletcher from health policy watch elaine please go ahead and sorry no thank you hi thanks for taking my question the World Bank announced recently that we'll put its spring meeting on a virtual format. And that move was applauded in many quarters as something that would also save carbon emissions and travel costs, which are significant for global organizations. And many private companies, meanwhile, have also begun to encourage teleworking as a preemptive move to re reduce infection risks. What's your message on these topics? And is WHO making contingency plans for a virtual World Health Assembly? Leave the DG to comment on the World Health Assembly. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I think we, we advise a, a risk management approach uh, to all of these different gatherings and meetings. And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, we are entering a, a new era on this planet in terms of our, uh, our, our, our movement and how we engage and how we interact with each other. And it's wonderful to see that we have alternatives now to necessarily having to meet face to face all the time. And if there is a benefit to the planet, uh, then th that is great. But uh, we would obviously rather not have COVID-19 and the fear and the uh, disruption that it's causing. But we have to, life has to go on. Uh, our economies, our societies, our communities have to continue to work, to live, to educate. Uh, but I think we also need to innovate. And it's wonderful to see the innovation mm -hmm. in education, the innovations in communications, the innovations in, in our capacity to continue doing the things we do, but maybe using alternative ways of achieving the same ends. And if there are benefits to our planet for that and to, to our society in general, that's great. But um, I think we'd, we'd like to get rid of COVID-19 too, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, maybe to, to add to that, um, you know, I know we will have uh, this COVID-19 behind us. And uh, virtual meetings uh, should actually be considered, not because of COVID now, but when there is no COVID. Uh, we, we, we have to challenge um, you know, all our meetings, whether we really need to meet in, in person. Um, so that's our advice. But in the middle of the COVID-19 now, as Mike said, we, we have to do the assessment, risk assessment, and make our decisions based, based on that. But the virtual meetings, teleworking, should actually be an issue even when we don't have COVID around. Uh, as you said, one added advantage is um, minimizing the carbon uh, footprint. But there will be other advantages too. Let's go back to uh, on assembly. Of ah. course, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on assembly, um, uh, we, we still have time. So we will uh, uh, assess the situation. Uh, it's uh, what we said based on the risk. Uh, we, will, we will decide. We will let you know. Thank 
you very much. We will go back here, but uh, we will take one or two from the room because we want to go back to online. You will remember yesterday we had issues and we didn't take uh, questions from our colleagues. Uh, yes, please, Shoko, and then Jamie, and then we'll go back online. Hello, uh, Shoko, Dr. Uh, you just mentioned that the number of confirmed cases is now reaching 100,000, and it's spread to 88 countries, areas, and places. <coughs> do you consider it as a new phase, or how do you characterize this uh, situation? Thank you. Mm. No, I, I, I said it yesterday that the, um, it's geographically expanding and it's deeply concerning. Um, but at the same time, uh, the most concerning is out of the 88 countries, we're saying more countries affected from the low income with weaker health systems. And that's the most concerning. And we're working with all countries to tailor uh, the response they should they should take based on their uh, uh, situation. And our focus will be to support countries with weaker health uh, systems. There was a question from Uganda earlier. I fully agree with what uh, our general said on Uganda. Its preparedness level has increased significantly, especially after uh, Ebola in, 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 in DRC, and we have seen how it's, uh, it, was, it has been responding. Um, but still, uh, we will continue to support, especially the um, um, countries with weaker health systems, um, to uh, help them to better uh, respond. That will be our focus. And that's why we had a meeting with all AU ministers a couple of weeks ago to discuss about continental strategy for preparedness and also national strategy for preparedness. <coughs> Jamie, sh short question, please. Um, hi, Jamie, Associate Press. Um, I'd like to go back to um, the behavioral things that people can do, because I think there's still a lot of confusion out there about what people can do. Um, you mentioned, you know, sort of you know, sneezing, coughing, or sneezing in your arm, et cetera. But what about in terms of their households? I mean, are there things that they can do? Should they be buying bleach? Should they be wiping their faces, touching their faces with Kleenexes? I mean, what kind of things can people do to make themselves live um, more uh, sorry, um, sanitate, by greater sanitation to be able to prevent this? I'll start with this, and, and you may want to supplement. So there are, it's, it's very important that everyone knows that there are many things that they can do um, to protect themselves and to protect their families against COVID-19 and to protect against any infectious threats. The first is washing your hands. You've heard us say this many times, and, it, and uh, it's it's absolutely critical that people wash their hands, um, and, and there's a process for doing so. Um, and using soap and water and, and or using an alcohol rub. That's the first thing. The second thing is respiratory etiquette. Um, we see many people not practicing respiratory etiquette and this is really important. This is very simple. You and your family and everyone you know can do this. It's sneezing into your elbow. It's sneezing into a tissue and throwing this into a closed bin and then washing your hands. Making sure that you are well informed. Um, you all know this very well in this room, but this situation is evolving quickly. Um, we're learning new information every single day, and we're trying to communicate that information to you as quickly as possible, making sure that that information is accurate. Um, there's a lot of false information out, out there. There's a lot of myths that are out there that are not only confusing, but sometimes could be damaging. So that's important. You can get your families ready. You can talk to your children. Uh, you can talk to your um, parents. Um, you can talk to older people. If you know if you have neighbors that, that don't live with other people, talk to them. Find out what do they need to know. What are their fears? Um, as the DG has said many times, facts not fears. Let's address these fears and turn this fear into some positive action. Um, you can talk to your um, employers. You can talk to your government. What are you doing to get ready? How are we getting ready? What's the plan? So there's a lot of things that you can do to get yourselves ready so that you can anticipate what may come. We've said this before, that, that there is no eventuality here. We are working with governments, with individuals, to make sure that everything is done to drive this down, to slow transmission, to stop transmission. So that is possible, and we're seeing that in many countries. But this 
it all depends on the actions that we take now. The situation could get worse, the situation could get better. We need to prepare for different, different situations. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriela, you are next to me. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. No um, problem, uh, no, no need. Sorry. Um, can you, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, could you say something about Switzerland? Uh, we are here. So if you can talk about this and uh, measures that they have taken, uh, what is your uh, opinion on that? Thank you. Want to speak to <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Gabriela likes to ask me, so I, I, <laughs> I'd say it's just to answer. <laughs> yeah. I have a general yeah. Yeah. Now we've, Well, first of all, we express uh, our uh, gratitude to the government in Switzerland for their cooperation with us and all of the other UN agencies in terms of our own business continuity planning and other things here. It's a, there's a big international community here in Geneva and we've been working very closely with them on, on, on how we deal with uh, business continuity going forward. Um, you can imagine we have our own uh, concerns too to be able to continue to run our operations in, in WHO, not only for, for our normal health programs, but to be able to continue running uh, a global operation here or a global nerve centre. So we, we thank the Swiss authorities for their continued cooperation. Um, I believe the Swiss authorities are implementing measures that from their pre-plans, uh, preparedness plans, and are engaging very closely with other countries and trying to coordinate activity across many countries. I think that's been the challenge for everyone in Europe right now, is coordinating activities across all of the nations of Europe with such open borders and uh, uh, many having slightly different policies regarding mass gathering, slightly different criteria regarding testing. And I think that's uh, caused a lot of uh, people to question uh, why there isn't one standard approach in every country. But that's impossible to achieve. What we need, each country is making its own risk assessments based on the risks it perceives, its openness, its exposure, and its own vulnerabilities. And we continue to say this. And what we will do is always, when asked, uh, and sometimes even when not asked, offer advice to countries regarding the the approaches they're taking to uh, to risk management. So um, I don't have any specific comments to make on the Swiss response uh, unless there's some specific issue you have a concern with because it's a good public health system responding to the issues that it faces. Thank you very much. Uh, let's try to take a couple of more questions from online to make up for, for yesterday. Uh, Marianne Benitez from Hong Kong. Uh, uh, Marianne, can, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. yeah can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for, for taking my call. But I, you know, this afternoon, the University of Hong Kong and their Wuhan counterparts released a study showing that the mortality rate from COVID-19 is much lower than the what the WHO has said of uh, three three point four percent. They said that's lower than three percent, and it could be lower. But is mortality rate really important, and what's the implication of that? You know, I mean, what does WHO think about uh, studying the mortality rate at this stage when we don't have, you know, there are so many unknowns. Well, I think we, we, we understood the question. Yeah. Um, studying mortality is very important in any infectious disease and in, in any disease uh, period. Um, and from the beginning, our biggest concerns, our biggest questions were around the transmissibility of this virus and the, and the severity of this virus. Um, we, we have been up here talking to you about the difficulties in calculating a mortality rate and what that actually means, especially early on in an outbreak. And there are many studies that describe why this is very difficult. Um, so, you know, there could be simple arithmetic, you know, in terms of, of what we say, but the study that you're referring to is, is a modeling study, and we work very closely with the University of Hong Kong. Um, they're strong collaborate, they're a collaborating center, a WHO collaborating center. Um, and there are many studies that have tried to estimate what mortality would look like if we consider everyone that may be infected with this virus. Um, you've heard us talk about zero surveys and making sure that there's certain population-based zero surveys that are conducted, and those are critical so that we really understand the extent of infection in the general population. I've mentioned those studies are underway, but it will take some time to get those results. In the meantime, we work with many different modeling groups that help us to try to use mathematical models um, 
to estimate what population infection may look like. And so what that study is, is in fact, is a, is a modeling study that's looking and making an estimate of, of a mortality rate, which I think is about 1% in that study. Um, so we've said before that the, the true mortality rate, we don't know. Um, at this time, what we can say is how many people have died up to this date, um, but we do look to our, our partners to, to estimate mortality. Um, if we take into consideration the estimated you know, number of people that may be infected, the mortality rate will go down. So it will take some time before we actually get a true, a true value, but it is a very important um, value for us. Um, any death is, 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 is significant. Um, and as we've mentioned, the steps that need to be taken to make sure we slow down this, um, this virus will, will save lives. All of the efforts towards containment will save lives. And maybe I could add to that that obviously a lot of the speculation, the modeling, and, and the attempt to understand is, you know, why so few people under 40 have been clinically <clears throat> unwell. Most of the people who are really sick are between the ages of 40 and, and 90. Um, and therefore, when we look to calculate uh, a case fatality, yes, we could add in a whole bunch of young people and children who may be getting infected and are not getting sick. And, that, and that's important. And the overall case fatality will drop. That may not necessarily affect the experience of older people. And remember, within this, if you look at the data from China, based on the numbers reported, the actual case fatality for people in the older age group goes up with age mm -hmm. and goes up significantly with the presence of underlying conditions. So the actual age-specific or condition-specific mortality could be much higher than those numbers. So the numbers could be higher for, for um, individuals who are... Um, <clears throat> who are, have underlying conditions, it could be higher for, uh, and, 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 and equally, uh, we have an assumption that children are maybe getting infected or are having mild infections. I personally have experienced in the past influenza epidemics amongst children with uh, low nutrition, children in, in compromised refugee type settings, and their mortality can be much higher. They're much more vulnerable. They're living in much more exposed conditions. We've seen what normal respiratory infection can do uh, in refugee camps. And anyone who's worked in a refugee camp knows how devastating viral disease can be in those situations. So <clears throat> while we can make some assumptions and we hope for the best, and we hope, I hope fervently mm -hmm. that we find that there are millions of people who've been infected asymptomatically and, and uh, the overall mortality is lower. We're not, we're, that's not something we hope for. But we have to look to those, and the DG keeps speaking about this, look to those around you who are most vulnerable. Look to the people who are older, look to people with underlying conditions, look to our refugee populations, look to the undernourished, look to people who may have other long-term infectious uh, conditions. Uh, and that's what we need to do <clears throat> um, in order that we put in place the necessary services to protect and save their lives. And that's the approach. But we do hope over time that as we do the serology, we find that the overall fatality is lower. Thank you very much. Let's try to take two more questions. Uh, we have a BuzzFeed. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it's Zahra Hidri, but please correct me. Can you hear us? Hi, thank you. Yes, it's Zahra Hidri. And I've been seeing some mixed reporting out of China about whether people can get reinfected versus being released from hospitals prematurely. Can you provide clarity on what is actually known at this point about the potential for reinfection? We know um, is there's certain discharge discharge criteria that are that are used in China and in many countries. And in fact, our uh, our recommendation is that an individual needs to have two negative PCR tests 24 hours apart. Um, what we what we've seen from China, there are some case reports of individuals who will test negative, um, and be and and be clinically recovered, um, but after some days may test positive again. Um, and what we what we need to understand is in those situations, in each of those situations, is the individual is it a matter of the way that the test was done and perhaps um, the sample was how the sample was collected, the performance of the PCR test, and if the individual just uh, sort of borderline positive negative, or whether they were reinfected. The, from the evidence we have, 
it's, it doesn't indicate that they've been reinfected. It's likely that they've just been, there's been some, some virus persistence. What we need to also understand is just because people are PCR positive, um, if they've tested negative and then test positive again, we need to understand if that's infectious. And so we need prospective studies of individuals who have recovered over time and following them after their recovery uh, to take repeated samples to understand if they're still shedding and if, if they are infectious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, while agreeing with what uh, Maria said, uh, even in other countries, uh, there is one concern we have. Uh, ho hospitals have been running very lean and mean, mm -hmm. uh, especially in high-income countries, uh, creating a lot of efficiency. And when I say lean and mean, making it very close to what they need during normal times, you know, the number of beds they need and, and, and so on. And that's why we see some surprise in, in, in high income countries. And when emergencies uh, actually arrive, uh, then, uh, you know, triggering or expanding that lean and mean system becomes a bit uh, difficult and time, time uh, taking. And that may even force some countries to discharge patients early because the system is adapted to lean and mean uh, approach. Uh, so I think this is a question for even the long term. Mm -hmm. Okay, running uh, hospitals in a lean and mean fashion could be okay during regular times, but how can we expand the capacity in few hours when the need comes. It's not COVID only, by the way. It could be earthquake, <laughs> or it could be tsunami. It could be another, another uh, um, what do you call it, disaster, whether it's man-made or, or natural. So I think we have to check that uh, approach we have, especially in many countries, running hospitals in a very lean and mean way. Uh, and I know some countries couldn't even have um, you know isolation isolation facilities that can accommodate even 10 or 20 and it, it shows how vulnerable we are yeah. and the discharging and so on could could uh, the, the, you know uh, early could come because could happen because of that let's try uh, to take thomas from bloomberg who was not able to ask questions a couple of uh, days in a row so thomas if you hear us please go ahead Hi, I think I've Hi. been unmuted. I'm not Thomas from Bloomberg. It's Helen Branswell from STAT. Sorry for the delay. Just realized I was unmuted. Um, my question is about the clinical trials in China for the therapeutics. Are you getting any word yet about uh, how those are turning out? Is, are there any, you know, is there any chance of data soon? I will turn to my colleagues to, to finish that. So as you know, Helen, there are many clinical trials that are currently underway in China. Uh, there are more than 200 registered um, you know, on the clinical trials list, and, and um, we know that they're actively underway, um, looking at different therapeutics, looking at traditional Chinese medicine. Anna Maria, do you want to comment on the more detail on that, please? Thank you very much. So, yes, we have a very good collaboration with researchers in China. In fact, they uh, even share with us preliminary information as they move forward with the analysis. Uh, they are planning to soon start releasing and publishing some of the results. Uh, I just want to say that they have done a great work in publications. We have counted about 180 publications 
internationally have been released and the information is available to the public. And there are other 50 publications in Chinese language that have been made available. Uh, what we are engaging with them now is in the translation of this information, in seeing what the numerous trials that were conducted mean in terms of public health, and whether or not we need to adjust our ideas for clinical trials elsewhere, and also um, how can we learn from the implementation of these trials, because there is a great expertise now in China that we would like to build upon. So yes, we are working with them very closely, and they are very forthcoming and transparent with us. Just to supplement, because there's more to be done than just China. Uh, uh, we have issued master protocols for clinical trials, uh, for serology studies, for others, and uh, working under the, the leadership of, of, of Anna Maria Marie Pierre Vazi and uh, our chief scientist, uh, uh, Sumia. Uh, we need to bring all of that data together. We need a day. We're pulling together a data monitoring board, an independent board of experts who will, will monitor and analyze that data with us, uh, because <clears throat> we need to ensure that all of the available information regarding clinical trials is pulled together, so we have the best possible assessment of all of the data. Uh, so we commend the researchers for all of the work they're doing independently and with us. We commend those who are willing to work on on on, on implementing this more standardized approach. And we believe by doing that, we will get to answers more quickly. Mm -hmm. And the, the evidence for these products will be much more solid uh, and, and much more reliable. Uh, and we thank all of those around the world at the research level and governments and others for that form of collaboration. It is through this kind of innovation and sharing that we will get the answers more quickly than we would otherwise. We also have to look beyond the issue of efficacy. Having an effective drug, or, and we hope these are effective, we also have to ensure that those who most need those drugs get them. And that is not the same as drug efficacy. We have to absolutely focus now on equity and access. We cannot have a situation where people who need the drug don't get it and people who don't need the drug do. Uh, we must find ways to ensure we can scale up production of any drugs that prove effective and we can ensure those drugs are distributed on the basis of need and the basis of benefit. And WHO is already working on mechanisms by which we can achieve that, working with our partners both uh, in the north and the south. Thank you very much. This was uh, Anna Maria Henao Restrepo, who is a unit head, uh, research and development blueprint with our emergency program. Let's try uh, Chris one more time, Thomas from Bloomberg, before we uh, finish for today. Thomas, can you hear Thomas, us? Can you hear Thomas, us? can you hear Thomas, us? Thomas, can you hear us? Thomas, can you hear us? to leave it then for tomorrow. We will conclude for today. Thanks everyone for watching us. Uh, we will have audio file and transcript and uh, maybe Dr. Tedros will tell us when do we see each other again. See you on Monday. Bon weekend. <laughs> bon weekend.